going down in enemy territory was probably the last thing in my mind. Nous avons constaté que ces gens voudraient récidiver leurs gestes pour revenir et qu'ils voudraient rejoindre l'Angleterre. It takes a lot of courage for these people to hide an Allied airman. If a member of the underground movement was caught, he was shot or beheaded or tortured or whatever. So many airmen were helped by these people. If you want to see what a hero looks like, all you have to do is look at the people that were involved in safe houses, as keepers and as messengers and as guides. They risked so much when they helped you. And uh, you couldn't help but appreciate it. The other day, I was out uh, doing some yard work. I thought back to uh, the time in Belgium when the Gestapo had captured us. I was uh, taken into prison. As we went in, looking up, and there was the German flag, the big old swastika flying over the prison. And then I kind of glanced up and down the street, and there were several <coughs> ladies elderly ladies sweeping the streets with just big old uh, brooms. I thought, man, I'd lie. I'd give anything just to be out there sweeping the streets. You don't realize what your freedom means to you until it's taken away. To understand my father's story, you have to understand why complete strangers would fight and die for one another. For me, it all began as a bedtime story. When I was a young boy, my father had an old atlas that had belonged to my grandmother. Dad would open the book and point to a map and say, I've been to London. Then he'd turn the page and say, I've been to Paris. And then he'd say, I've been to Brussels. From an eight-year-old boy's point of view, what happened to my father during the war was like a fairy tale. As I grew older, the atlas went back on the shelf. There were some things my father remembered, and some he tried to forget. From Belgium. May 28th, Leopold, King of the Belgians, surrendered and the world declared. The ever growing British and American air might brings destruction upon French held forts and over the Reich itself. United Nations flyers maintain daylight trade with constantly increasing frequency. For the longest time, I just tried to forget about it. 
he just spoke in general terms. He said he had been a prisoner a while, and then another two weeks or a month, he might have mentioned that he escaped, and then he might have mentioned uh, no continuity of it that, uh, about being in the underground with all the people that helped him. And instead of saying he was scared to death, he would say, he would say it was rather nerve-wracking. <laughs> and I was thinking, I think it must have been a little bit more than that. <laughs> That's how I learned about it, just a little at a time. Over the years, I dragged bits and pieces of the story from my father. I learned that he'd bailed out over Belgium and had been helped by the resistance. And I wanted to know more about them. They were soldiers too, like Dad, but they fought the war in their homes every day with their families and risked everything just to help one pilot. What began for me as a bedtime story was just a small part of the enormous legacy left by the brave men and women who saved my father's life. They were just ordinary people who saw a need and quietly did the right thing. I think going back is an opportunity for me to say thank you to a lot of people. You know, you stop and realize those people, are, most of them are pretty old now. Like I am. United States Department of Health, Flight 124, Sergeant Russell, Belgium. Is this the two minutes moving in order? When I went overseas, I was fortunate enough to be assigned to uh, the 56th Fighter Group. It was the first fighter group in World War II to take P-47s into combat. It was an easy airplane to fly, and uh, you could outdive anything that the Germans had. Beginning about mid-1943, the British and Americans conducted massive bombing operations of Germany flying from the British Isles. Slow climb to the Dutch coast, the no put up into battle formation. Three hours from now, home again, if you're lucky. These were great spectacles. There could be, on any given day, a thousand, two thousand, ultimately as many as three thousand planes could be flying over Belgium and also nearby Holland. The air war over Belgium was unique because there were so many air forces involved in it. Lots and lots of aircraft were lost in our country. We're talking about four to five thousand aircraft which came down within the borders of Belgium. About 10,000 people were killed in that air war over Belgium. I think we had 29, 30 pilots in the squadron. There were seven pilots that were killed and eight or nine became prisoners of war. The mission of the 56th Fighter Group was to escort heavy bombers over the targets and make certain that when they were engaged by the Luftwaffe, the heavy bombers could reach their target and drop their bombs. Bombers would start assembling three or four hours before we would in the morning, and you would hear them taking off and droning around the skies, and you knew you'd had a mission that day. Two or three hours later, they'd come and wake you up. You'd go to briefing and take off. <laughs> We would uh, climb to altitude, and about the time we hit the coast of Europe, why, we'd catch up with the bombers. These guys really got in and chased off the Luftwaffe. I always had the thought that some of these other fellas may go down. but uh, I believe I'm gonna make it.
you know, when you're a kid, you think you can do anything. Going down in enemy territory was probably uh, the last thing in my mind. On November the 30th, we were providing escort for the group of bombers as they were going in to Solingen. And the bombers were being attacked by enemy fighters, and everyone was trying to get up uh, to the bombers. And uh, my engine just quit. We were about 23,000 feet and uh, left the formation. They were joining up with the bombers. I called uh, Gabby Krabeski. He was leading the squadron that day. And I said, Gabby, I said, I'm having engine trouble. I'm, I'm going home. He said, do you want anyone to go with you? And I said, no, I don't believe they can help me. So I started down from about 23, 25,000 feet. I went down to approximately 4,000 feet before I ever got the engine started again. And as I went down, I was circling around a large thunderstorm. The Germans had a very good anti-aircraft system. To avoid them, you either had to be real high or real low. If they caught you in the middle, they could give you quite a bit of trouble. So I was at 4,000 feet. I just dropped down to treetop level, picked up a compass heading back to England. Any fighter pilot returning to base had the standing instructions that any ammo left in the plane could be used on any target of their choice as long as it would bring great damage to the enemy. I was going along pretty well. Then a little bit later on, uh, I saw the train and it looked like I had a big open field between me and the train, and so I just dropped down, and I was going in level at it, shooting. Als dat toen gebeurd is, dan was ik uh, 14 jaar ge gepasseerd, en uh, we zaten gezamenlijk in huis. Hè? En ik, ik hoorde een geweldig, geweldig lawaai van een vliegtuig dat wij dachten, ja, dat ga je ogenblikkelijk vallen, hè. Was er ook een kogel door de achteruit gevlogen, juist naast de grootmoeder Aror. Then all at once, a big telegraph pole showed up between me and the train, and that's when my trouble started. Pulled up, and about that time, I took the top out of a, a pear tree and hit the pole. I'd pulled back on the stick just before I hit the pole and had enough momentum to, I was going up. Boven de bomen zien komen, waar het zijn hoogste punt bereikte en dan uh, tegenovergestelde een bocht naar, naar beneden dood. En dat toen, nee, dan is het wel wat hier van, dan zeggen we het tegen hier. I went as high as the airplane would go. The airplane stalled and I thought, well, man, <laughs> you're going to be hamburger in about a minute. If you don't get out of here. Het was mij toen duidelijk dat het toestel verloren was. I slid the canopy back, unbuckled the safety belt, stood up in the cockpit. When I got my head and shoulders up in the slipstream, it just sucked me out. Uh, I didn't have to jump. As soon as I felt like I was clear of the airplane, I pulled the ripcord. I saw the end of it and I thought, hell, I broke it. But uh, about that time, a chute popped and uh, I swung back and forth a time or two and I was on the ground. I'd been trying to piece together Dad's story from his memories, but Walter Verstraten, a Belgian author and history buff, and something of an expert about Dad's story, was one of the first people I contacted who could really help fill in some of the blanks. He agreed to be our guide as Dad retraced his steps. How are you? Oh, I'm so I glad to see you too. I'm kind of anxious to see if I can halfway retrace my steps. After I uh, first bailed out, I was pretty close to a little farm village.
corner of the story. And I guess the, air, the airplane crashed somewhere in this area. And they had one hell of a fire. <laughs> Something you never expected to experience coming back. Yeah, all I could see over there was just one hell of a big ball of fire burning. I had these stuck up or something, and the boots still out of the brandy. People were coming out of the village, running to see what was going on out there. I've been then by the place to come. I've seen the rock seen out, seen upstairs, out in Slagkuil, zal ik zeggen. Maar ik ben uh, wel op uh, afstand gebleven. En nu lag ze hier over de bocht met zijn parasite. Uh, uh, 30 meter verder misschien lag hij. Got out of my chute real quick. I was fairly close to a farmer's barn. I was probably 50 yards away, I guess. And I saw this farmer come out, of, out around the corner of the barn. And I just waved to him and took off. I, I, I saw a farmer come around the corner. <laughs> that where those cows were running? <laughs> <laughs> I, I waved to him. <laughs> But I was directly in the middle of the door, but I didn't see him. But I saw him a little bit. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't try to bury my parachute or anything. I just thought I'd better get out of there pretty fast. Two fellas were coming toward me, and I thought, well, I've got to ask someone for help. I'll try out my French on them. Well, what I said was, Je suis Americana, pouvez-vous made it? I am an American, can you help me? And they nodded, yes, they, they could help me. And they motioned for me to go with them, and they started back toward the village. About that time, I saw this uh, lady come riding up on a bicycle. She said that she in so to say, in een toestand was al, hey, ja, uh, moet ik dat zeggen, dat hij in gevaar was. We just made eye contact and she just shook her head no and uh, pushed her bicycle on past us and went on. And I thought, well, there's something wrong here. So I motioned to the two fellas just to go on, to leave me alone. I took off on the run. The lady had gone on down the road on her bicycle, pedaling her bicycle. I'd cut through the fields and just keep her inside. Yeah, I said they're coming. Yeah, they're my coming to open it, and I said they're not going to come. And that was it. All that's going to be enough. And then I was here with my new soldiers. And they were like that always broken. With the revolver in my hand, and I had to go overall. Binnen gaan and the door of the kassen open trekken in the kelder op the zolder. In die kamers, tot zullen we installeren in 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 schuur overal. I guess I followed the lady for about three miles, where I finally saw her stop at a farmhouse. And uh, when I got to the farmhouse, I, she was waiting at the front door for me. That was her character, and she took it on for a good day, think I. Ordinary people all of a sudden became confronted with an airman who was hidden in their backyard. And they simply wanted to help him. Hiding a pilot and being caught doing that almost certainly meant Death. I sent him in a bowl on his older ago. 
There was a, a farmer from the neighborhood came in and he said there is an Englishman who, who came in, in my farm and uh, he has been shot down, he said. And, uh, but I cannot talk to him because uh, I don't speak English. Can you come? Uh, so I went with him to his place. That's when I met Marcel Horney. And then Bill came and I asked him, uh, are you Englishman? He said, no, I am American. And he, he was very proud to, to say he was American. I was awful glad to see Marcel because he could speak English almost as well as I could. And the accent of Bill was very difficult to understand, you know. For instance, when, when he said pardon, instead of pardon, he said pardon. I, I still remember that, you know, pardon. And I said, what, what is that pardon? <laughs> he said, do you have any contacts, any addresses, places to go for help? I asked him if he wanted to be repatriated to England. He said yes, and I said okay, I will come uh, back after dark with civilian clothes, and then I will take you to Brussels. He said, I have a friend in Brussels. I'll take you to him, and we'll, we'll start from there. So I took him to the barn, and then there, there was a, a kind of potato pit. I stayed in that potato pit from probably about one o'clock in the afternoon till it got dark that evening. When it was about to be dark, the Germans were still seeking everywhere in the neighborhood. They made quite a house-to-house -house search. They caused quite a bit of trouble, I think. Then uh, we went on foot uh, to the village, and we took a streetcar there to Brussels. We were sitting in the streetcar inside. I told Bill not to talk. After a while, there was one uh, guy who came in the, in the streetcar, and he sat himself next to Bill, and he started to talk to him. And I answered in Bill's place, but he still insisted, you know, speaking to Bill. And then I told him, don't speak to him, because he's mute, he cannot hear you, he cannot speak to you. At any time, at any corner of the street, you could be stopped, you know. But when, when I tell it, you think it's very simple. It's, it's like now you take a, a street carrier to a certain point, and there you change. You walk a few hundred yards, and you take another street car. But it was not like that at that moment, of course. The two young men from before, after 57 years and a half, will meet as old men. How are you? Oh, so good to see you. I'm very happy to see you again. I thought I would never see you again. I was always very anxious to, to learn something about him. We were both young, expecting a lot of life. And I became older and he became older. That was quite a time. Yes, it was. It's nice to have it behind us. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact. I was proud to have met him. Because he was one of the guys who was fighting for us, for our freedom. He took me to a Catholic priest, to a church. I was hiding here because I was refusing to work in Germany, uh -huh. and then uh, the vicar here had given me shelter. And he said, I don't care if you are Catholic or Protestant, the only thing that counts for me is that you are a patriot. 
As I remembered, it was dark when we got here. I'm pretty sure it was this way when you came in. I stayed with the Catholic priest for four days. Marcel looked around through the neighborhood and, and contacted various people that he knew. I went already out to see some people, to contact some people. It was rather difficult to contact an escape organization at first, particularly if you weren't involved in the resistance in some way. Well, it's kind of nerve-wracking. You, you really never knew exactly who to trust. If a member of the underground movement was caught, he was shot or beheaded or tortured or whatever. The Geneva Convention, it didn't apply in the eyes of the Germans. I was endangering my life. The vicar was endangering everybody in the underground, you know? We knew we were risking our life, and we were prepared for it. We were not at war, theoretically, but in fact, we were occupied. In the beginning of the occupation, the German army gave directive to be good, to be poli polite. When they're coming in a shop, they say, uh, uh, good morning. And many people they say, oh, they are not the same that in the first war. But slowly, practically every day, uh, an announce from a person sentenced to death and executed for uh, one of another reason. Then when they arrest uh, the Jewish people, personally, uh, when I see that this man arresting young children, I can don't accept that. They learned to hate the occupier. They had no food. They were treated arrogantly by the occupier. They saw their men shipped off to Germany as forced laborers. They simply hated the occupier and would do anything they could to fight back. Then I got in contact with uh, Charles Austin. The whole structure of hiding places was organized by Charles Hoster. He was a man who was also working for the local government in Scharbeek, and he knew a lot of people. He was one of the founding members of the EVA organization. EVA stands for evasion, and it was formed by people in Brussels, some of them before the war, were working for the local government. So they knew how to find, for instance, false ideas. Bien voilà, la ligne Eva a été introduite parce que nous avions récupéré quelques aviateurs dans notre ligne de, de renseignement. Nous avons constaté que ces gens voulaient récidiver leurs gestes pour revenir et qui voudraient rejoindre l'Angleterre. So many airmen were helped by these people. Their function was to collect airmen who had been brought in from the various provinces in Belgium. They would assemble them in Brussels, they would give them shelter, and then they would try and evacuate them on one of the evacuation lines. Nous adorions le pays depuis toujours. Nous avons aimé notre, notre pays. Et nous ne savions que faire pour enrayer l'avance des Allemands. He said, Bill, he says, I think, uh, I think we've, we've contacted the right people. But he says, I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, we've got to trust somebody sometime. Uh, let's give them a try. The only people I believe I saw yeah. were you and Leclerc. Uh, Leclerc, yeah. Leclerc. Leclerc. And uh, then when they brought the fellow from the underground. When Eva was made aware that there was an airman somewhere in the country, one of their representatives would go out and interview the airman. On les interrogeait où ils étaient tombés, ce qu'ils ont fait avant d'arriver 
et de tomber chez des gens qui ne voulaient pas les donner aux Allemands. All these elements were checked later on by someone else in the organization who by radio contacted London and asked if that particular pilot was indeed the airman he said he was. At a given day, I had an appointment with Charles Ost in another place. And there I took, took uh, streetcar number 14 with Bill. And then uh, when we came at the Botanic Gardens, we went down and uh, Charles Ost was already waiting. I introduced Bill to him, you know. Ost told me, you listen to BBC and uh, if you hear the following message, il n'y a pas de Pyrénées pour les grands oiseaux, which means uh, there are no Pyrénées for the big birds. It means that he has made it to England, that he is okay. So at the given date, I was listening and I heard the message coming in, crisp and clear, you know. So I was convinced that he was back in England and maybe back to the States already. I left Bill with uh, Charles Oster, and that was the last time I saw him. Then they started processing me through the underground, and they took me to a place called the fish market. That particular fish market was a vital piece in the whole escape line. When the airman entered the fish market, there were four people waiting for him. The first one would be Prosper Spilliard, whose job it was to make pictures and develop the photos that were needed to put on the ID cards. Well, they got me some false identification papers with a picture on it. There would also be Alphonse Escrignier, who was the man responsible for finding out whether he was truly the person he claimed to be. At this point, they, of course, would be able to question him in detail. Alors là, l'interrogatoire qui commençait à nous faire savoir que c'était vrai qu'il était un rescapé de l'avion tombé. If uh, they didn't answer the questions correctly, the, the the person being questioned was in serious trouble. While their picture was about to be taken, they were they were shot. Il y avait les, corré les corrélations de l'histoire de l'aviateur recueilli qui nous permettait de dire oui, c'est un bon ou un mauvais. Blanche Page would escort the airman to his exact location. J'avais à faire mon devoir et mon devoir était de mener cet homme où il serait en sûreté. They didn't really give you too much information when we would go out, go from one place to another. They might walk, oh, 40 or 50 paces ahead of you. Because if you were caught, they didn't want to be associated with you. And you just kind of had to follow along. Les yeux fermés, je devais aller mon chemin avec l'homme qui me suivait. S'il y, y avait des gestes à faire quand euh, il y avait danger, et chacun était instruit de ce qu'il avait à faire comme réaction. Moi, je sais une chose, c'est que j'ai chaque fois amené mes hommes où ils devaient aller. They brought me uh, into this area at, at night, and uh, I didn't have the vaguest idea where I was. The first safe house I stayed in, it was just an elderly lady and her daughter. Mon, mon arrière-grand-mère Joséphine a été abordée par la résistance, donc son rôle était d'abriter les gens qui en avaient besoin. Mais d'abord, je, je l'ai bien connue, mon arrière-grand-mère. Elle était modeste quand elle parlait de ce qui lui était arrivé, mais je me rendais compte, même petite fille, que c'était vraiment de, de l'héroïsme. I slept in a little old nook where the roof came down and had a bunch of heavy blankets in there. And it was a pretty good place to sleep. You yeah. could hear the rain pattern on the roof sometimes. These safe houses 
were very difficult to come by. You needed people who would share their bread, share their rations. The uh, average Belgian's uh, calorie intake was seriously rationed by the Germans. It was almost at a starvation level. I remember especially uh, Christmas of uh, 43. She had a little Christmas party. Somehow or other, she managed to get a pretty good sized roast. And we had roast beef for Christmas dinner. Elle parlait des aviateurs qu'elle avait hébergés avec beaucoup d'émotion. Elle me disait qu'ils étaient jeunes, qu'ils étaient beaux et bien élevés. Elle en avait un, un très très bon souvenir. À l'époque, elle avait 58 ans et elle avait, je crois, par rapport à eux, un sentiment très très maternel. I don't recall exactly how long I stayed with the underground before they first tried to move us uh, down through France and across the Pyrenees. Et là, il est hébergé à gauche ou à droite chez des habitants jusqu'à ce que le système, le système de d'évacuation démarre de l'Espagne. De, de, de Pyrénées. At the start of the war, there were efforts made to try to move people to the coast of northern Europe. Defenses on the Atlantic shore and on the English Channel of the Germans were just too strong and it was just too difficult. The Comet Line was an underground railroad that extended from Brussels right down to the Spanish Pyrenees. The creation of the Comet Line in itself is a very beautiful story because, first of all, it was created by the most unlikely person you can think of, a young girl of 25 years old. Dede de Young showed up at the British consulate in Bilbao in mid-1941, having brought down two soldiers with her. She uh, returned a short time later with, uh, with three more. Allied personnel, and by this time they realized perhaps they should be taking her seriously. C'est-à-dire que puisque chaque fois le guide d'une région doit monter, my job was uh, to lead the men from Brussels to Paris. Et le guide de Paris arrive, les prend en charge. The very difficult part is to cross the border, of course. As uh, nearly all English doesn't know one word of French or Flemish, it's very difficult. Les conduits à Paris, où ils sont à nouveau logés. There they would find themselves another train, taking them to Bordeaux. Puis un autre voyage, les conduits en train par Bordeaux au pied des Pyrénées. Là, on leur donne un vélo. L'aviateur est logé au pied des Pyrénées jusqu'à ce qu'un guide basque les prenne en charge. C'est une traversée de 11 heures de marche dans la montagne. Crossing uh, the, the Pyrenees was, was very difficult and arduous. And when you got to the border between France and Spain, suddenly there was a river uh, called the Bidasoa River. At certain times of the, of the year, the pilots would have to wade across in water, sometimes rising almost up to their shoulders. They risked their lives, and the guides risked their lives getting them across the river. L'ambassade d'Angleterre est prévenue Évidemment, une organisation qui les ramène à l'eau. I was on my way uh, to start my journey across the Pyrenees. On the evening of January 5th, 1944, an escort for Ava named Gaston Matisse knocked on the door. The time had come for my father to leave Belgium. Gaston Matisse was uh, the fellow who was responsible in EVA for turning airmen over to the Comet Line. They soon reached the Gare du Nord, the North Station. 
but before they entered the station, they approached a man that Gaston seemed to recognize, a man called Del Tour. Mon père était dans l'armée. Mon père s'appelait Jules Rico. Et il était connu dans le réseau comme Del Tour. Je pense que devait, papa devait organiser les hébergements, entre autres. Il devait trouver euh, des endroits pour cacher les aviateurs lorsqu'ils partaient pour la France. Il était chargé aussi de fournir des faux papiers d'identité. Euh, et il, il a fait également des escortes. Jules Draco was the acting manager for Comet in uh, Brussels. He was really uh, the heart and soul of the movement in that city. Draco took charge of my father and walked him through the gates of the Gare du Nord. He had now passed into the care of the Comet line. I believe I had a, quite a bit of hope after uh, I got connected with the, with the underground. I kind of felt like maybe we'd make it then. We were to meet with someone that would take us on and, and start us on our trip uh, toward the Pyrenees. À ce moment-là, euh, notre guide de Bruxelles sur tournée, c'était Raymond Itorbé, qui s'est fait arrêter dans le train au départ de Bruxelles avec deux aviateurs. When I uh, was arrested, I was in the uh, train of Lille, for a train from Brussels to Lille. This person was supposed to show up and he, he just never showed. We may never truly know why my father's guy did not arrive on that cold January night. But I was able to learn from post-war documents exactly what happened next. Jules Draco handed my father off to what appeared to be a teenage girl, a girl named Michou. This uh, young girl that was guiding me from one safe house to another, I, I thought at the time that she's probably about 14 years old. Kind of small, petite person. J'étais petite, j'étais pas jolie, euh, je passais fort inaperçue. It was not expected that women would be leaders or operatives in any way. Michou's entire family was involved in the resistance. Her younger sister, Nadine, had played a critical role in the early days of the Comet Line. I look so young, so I think the German doesn't think uh, I, I can do something bad, you know, against them. Ma sœur, elle se fait arrêter en nous 41, euh, 42 en même temps que papa et maman. We were arrested all three. All three, my mother, my father and I. À ce moment-là, papa, au mois de juin, m'avait expliqué tout le fonctionnement. Il était venu me chercher pour mes vacances. Et donc, j'ai commencé doucement dans la clandestinité à continuer à avoir les contacts avec tous les, les sources de papa et de maman et de ma sœur. Agents were uh, living a very dangerous life. You can work three months, three, four months maximum. Une petite jeune fille anglaise qui m'aidait pour euh, parler avec les aviateurs et qui connaissait mon domicile avait été arrêtée. Her friend Jean McIntosh was arrested and uh, under pressure gave away Michou's real name, Michelin, as well as uh, the address she was staying at. It became clear that, that Michou had to move. Everyone, of course, in the organization would have known that Michou was burned at this point. Burned agents had to leave the country. She left a system of, of safe houses that were ready to carry on with her work. Je logeais une fois à droite, une fois à gauche, je n'avais plus rien à moi. Donc vraiment, là j'ai pris une source pour conduire de, à un hébergement, c'était vraiment la fin. Hein? During the course of our trip, she told me that uh, earlier she had been guiding a fella and they were walking along together. They came to a corner and he turned the corner to, to go toward the safe house and this girl hadn't indicated that they were going to turn the corner or anything. 
it made her suspicious that this fella already knew the way. The story I heard was that the, the fellow that was being guided was eliminated. <laughs> they thought that he might be a plant. So uh, when I was walking with her, <laughs> I didn't turn any corners. L'angoisse, elle vient après. Il faut être dedans et réagir tout de suite. Après, vous avez peur, mais au moment même, il faut agir. Donc, I was just kind of amazed at anyone that young being involved with the underground. She got me to the next house, all right. Michu delivered my father to the home of her close friends, the Bouchers. Maria Boucher was an elderly widow with three adult sons. Her son Roger worked closely with Michu, escorting Herman for the Comet One. Roger euh, faisait en plus de l'hébergement. Il était euh, guide. Il conduisait les aviateurs jusqu'à la frontière. Donc les Bouchers très gentiment ont accepté. But a lot of the people in the safe houses, they might have one other contact, and uh, that was all. They thought that the easiest way to survive was to have less organization rather than more. We didn't know how these people came to us or where they went afterwards. And that was not talked about. In a secret organization, we know practically nobody. We don't know if we can resist the torture. So the less we know, the better it is. On January the 12th, two guides, Henri Malfay and Jacques de Brun, arrived at the Boucher residence. My father was escorted to the home of Henri's father. Throughout January, my father was sheltered in several safe houses as the Belgian resistance struggled to make contact with a guide who could take him to the Pyrenees. For almost two months, they had given him safety and refuge, but now the Comet Line itself was exposed to a hidden danger. The Germans, they sent people around, you know, just to try to infiltrate the escape line. Jacques de Soubry was a young Belgian who came from the border area of France and, and Belgium. Lui, l'agent, était soutenu par notre chef, par Jacques Cartier. Or, c'était un monsieur très important à leur vue parce qu'il avait trouvé un système de passer la frontière à 30 ou 40 personnes en même temps. À ce moment-là, on n'en avait pas besoin, mais le futur avec, pouvait s'avérer très utile. Et donc, moi, je trouvais ça drôle, mais enfin, donc c'était un monsieur très important, soutenu par la Belgique. Jacques de Sabri's goal, once ordered by the Gestapo, was to infiltrate the Comet Line and completely destroy it. The arrest. Uh, which started as a sort of a dribble in the early part of the month, uh, just exploded. By late January, Jacques de Sorbry had accumulated enough information to bring the Comet line to its knees. The arrest included some of my father's key helpers, including Henri Malfay and Jules Strico. And they took him to the Gestapo de la de l'avenue Louise. Et c'est pour moi le premier de notre groupe qui a eu le sérum de vérité. Changement de tactique. En me tend un verre de bière avec un peu de liquide au fond. À deux mains, tremblant comme une feuille, je le vide d'un trait, sans goût. La tête me brûle, on me donne encore à boire. Tout se trouble, je bois encore. Ensuite, je ne me rappelle plus. Inconscient de ce qui se passe autour de moi, je me souviens toutefois qu'on introduit Jules Dricot, qu'on me présente une machine à écrire pour ensuite m'en arracher. Jules m'observe. Quand je le regarde, il baisse tristement les yeux. On January 22nd, the Germans raided the Boucher residence, where Michu had taken my father 10 days before. At the time, three other airmen were being sheltered there, and they escaped onto the roof. Madame Boucher and her son Roger were arrested. After one hour torture, they put me in front of Roger. The whole idea being that seeing my hurt son would make me talk. You can understand what a trial it was for a mother 
to see her son bearing many marks of his torture, bruises and broken teeth. We looked in each other's eyes and we understood we would never say anything right to the end. I was taken to St. Giles jail and stayed there seven months without a word of my family. In January 1944, the Comet Line collapsed. Unfortunately, both the Comet Line and the Eva Line, or certain segments of the Eva Line, became infiltrated by the German counterintelligence. Within a couple of days, the arrests began happening there, and pretty soon we had all of, virtually all of Comet in, in both cities picked up and imprisoned. By the end of 1943, Comet was passing on 16 airmen per week onto Spain. In January 1944, the whole thing stopped. After that, it was a, just kind of a continual move. You would stay at a place about a week, maybe two weeks. Then they'd uh, move you to another location. They didn't want the, the neighbors in any particular spot to get used to seeing you around. You didn't tell many people you were looking after them. And then if uh, somebody came in the house and happened to see uh, any of the airmen we had, we just told them they were uh, cousins who came from the country and they uh, were deaf and mute. Bon, mes parents accueillaient simplement les Américains. Voilà, je suis rentrée du pensionnat, j'ai dit bonjour à mes parents comme d'habitude. Je suis passée par le magasin et en arrivant près de la cuisine, qu'est-ce que je vois Bon, deux hommes dans la, dans la cuisine, l'un assis près de la table, l'autre étalant de la pâte sur la tasse sur la même table. Max Gottlieb was a Jewish boy from Chicago. I believe he was a radio operator on a B-17. He and I were staying at this safe house. Et uh, j'étais très étonné. Mon père qui me suivait a vu mes réactions et uh, il a dit dépose ta valise. Je vais t'expliquer. Nous sommes partis vers le verger, qui se trouve à dix minutes, un quart d'heure d'ici. Et sur la, le chemin, donc, euh, mon père a expliqué que c'était deux Américains, qu'ils les hébergeaient pendant plus ou moins 15 jours, etc. À ça, j'ai répondu, c'est dangereux chez nous, papa, parce que le, la maison ne s'y prête pas. Bon, la fin de promenade, nous rentrons à la maison. Bill n'était plus dans la cuisine, il y avait juste Max qui cuisait sa pâte. C'est que, bon, j'ai attendu l'heure du midi pour faire la connaissance de Bill Gorbanov. Bill et de Max Gottlieb. Je me rappelle que c'était des, des chouettes jeunes gens où j'allais parfois dire bonjour. Quand ils étaient chez Madame Drigue et chez Elliot, c'est comme ça que j'ai fait leur connaissance. He was uh, very quiet, very nice. But we couldn't have a conversation because I couldn't speak English. <laughs> so it was very difficult. It's surprising how you can communicate with a person and maybe not be able to speak, to speak their language. On my 18th birthday, we had a nice party, uh, which was also Bill's birthday. Uh, we managed to get a few bottles of wine and we made a nice birthday cake and we had a nice party. <laughs> what you have to remember is all our young men were either forced to work in Germany like my brother was and the others were in hiding. So we didn't have a chance to have a boyfriend. So you can imagine when you meet a nice young man who comes in your house, who is very charming and very nice, obviously you can fall in love with him, can't you? 
And that's what happened. I'm not telling you anymore. Mais comme tous les jeunes, je trouve qu'il y a un enthousiasme, il y a peut-être un besoin d'aventure. Je crois que c'est surtout la chose, le plaisir de vivre pendant une guerre qui n'était pas très joyeuse. Hein. People who became involved in the resistance and in the escape lines put themselves into a position where they made some terrible moral choices. Many of these sacrificed their family. They risked their lives. They also risked the lives of their children, of their mother, their father, their relatives. I think it was always in danger. My sister told me once that they were in the train with my father. Et la Gestapo est arrivée, ils ont arrêté le tram, ils fouillaient les gens, ils prenaient leurs identités et papa avait une mallette, suitcase, et il a donné la mallette à ma sœur. Et comme ça, par chance, ils n'ont pas fouillé la mallette. Et il y avait dedans des documents importants. Et ma sœur avait 6 ans, donc ils ne l'ont pas embêté. It's just beyond belief what they would risk to help you. In one safe house, the family had 10 children in the family. I remember that pretty well. They were all little kids. Jean Plus was a member of an intelligence organization. The fact that uh, he would participate in such a thing, despite the fact that he had a large family, I think says a lot about him and, and his commitment. They took me to a soccer game in the middle of the afternoon and there must have been two or three thousand people in the stands. I didn't feel very comfortable out in the crowd. Then his wife took me to a movie one night, and uh, I saw a movie tone newsreel of uh, a B-17 crew that had crash-landed and were captured, and uh, they were talking about the American gangsters. They fang in the Luft gangster. Gesichter, die noch die scharfen, schwersten Kampfes tragen, verwundet und mit letzter Not dem Tode entronnen. They looked off the rough. The Gestapo had raided a print shop right next door, and the fellow we were staying with, he worked part-time in the print shop. Everyone was just pretty nervous about the situation with the Germans next door. The underground decided they better get us out of there. I think they split Max and me up. He went to one safe house and I went to another. I was with a bomber pilot named John Brown from Eugene, Oregon. You know, we'd stay at a place uh, a week or two and then they'd move us. And we'd stay at a place uh, again a week or so and they'd move us. Vous savez, depuis le mois de septembre, on était inondé d'aviateurs. On pouvait pas, la ligne n'arrivait plus à évacuer. The airmen found themselves uh, isolated in their safe houses. Contacts were broken. It was just a horrible period for everyone who was involved. Parce que à ce moment-là, commençait une fameuse ligne, la KLM. The KLM line was an evacuation service that was centered in Antwerp. And it was said that they could evacuate uh, airmen out of the country, so their route would be by ship down to Spain from the city of Antwerp. The EVA organization decided they would start sending airmen up to Antwerp. They start off with uh, these three airmen, Dolgens, Byers, and Aikens. The man who bought them was uh, uh, made himself called uh, Donald, but his real name was René van Meulen. René van Meulen, Donald, he, he was very polite and uh, he had good manners. 
He pretended to be resistant, but he wasn't. He was just, he was, I learned it afterwards, a traitor. René Van Mulen was in fact an agent of the German Abwehr. He was given a special license to pursue evading airmen and find their helpers. Byers is separated from the group. He's sent off to this special apartment the Abwehr have set up. They have these language experts that are posing as resistance members. Some of these agents spoke English very, very well. And these people were very, very effective in infiltrating escape lines, including Eva. The Germans were running their own escape lines to entrap airmen. And over the course of time, they sent 35 airmen up there. They brought airmen, and then from my place went straight to the, to the prison with them. On May 3rd, my father and John Brown were escorted to a safe house owned by a widow named Madame Kloss. The last two evaders she kept included a burned Dutch agent and Lieutenant John Byers. Both had traveled from Madame Kloss to try their luck in Antwerp on the KLM line, and both had fallen into German hands. My father was likely under observation by the Germans from the moment he arrived. This is Madame Klein. John Brown and I were up on the second floor. Did you come downstairs much? Oh, no, no. No, no we, never. We, we stayed upstairs. The Germans often were able to put down surveillance on houses and on individuals. Their primary goal was not rolling up escape lines. No, they actually kept them on going. They might even never grab the safe house that they were looking at. John and I liked Madame Clyde's place because she had a radio that would pick up the BBC in England and we could listen to the news and find out what was going on in the war scene. On May 27th, my father remembers sitting on Madame Kloss' roof and watching the B-17s drop their bombs on the city of Brussels. By bizarre coincidence, the target was a rail yard close to Prosper's Billiards Fish Market, the headquarters of Ava. The Allies probably didn't have the faintest idea uh, that uh, they were going to miss the target a little bit and hit some populated areas. J'étais obligé de porter du courrier. Il y avait une alerte. Tous les agents étaient prévenus de ce qui allait se passer. Surtout chez le poissonnier, la planque centrale. Et là, je devais déposer du courrier. Et je suis arrivé au moment où l'alerte avait sonné et on descendait les volets. Les volets étaient descendus. J'ai gratté au, au volet. Et lorsque j'ai gratté, pour ma chance, Monsieur Spilliard Marcel était là. Il a ouvert la porte, il m'a tiré à l'intérieur. Il m'a dit, toi, tu descends dans la cave avec tout le monde qu'il y a là-bas. C'est pour nous. Je dis, non, je dois porter le courrier. Et ce courrier, il n'arrivera pas si tu restes dehors, en bas. Il m'a fait descendre. Il y avait plusieurs personnes dans la cave. Une petite cave, enfin, en dessous de la cuisine. À ce moment-là, l'alerte, était très, 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 très serré. On sentait qu'il y avait quelque chose. Les avions sont arrivés. Tous ces avions, ça passait, ça passait. Et quand je suis sortie de d'où on rentrait les charbons et tout ça, qu'est-ce que je vois Des fumées rouges, noires, des gravats, toutes sortes, toutes sortes, toutes sortes. Et là, à ce moment-là, il y avait des gens morts, des têtes, des bras, une tête devant moi, la tête d'un receveur ricanant, et cette tête souriante, je la reverrai chaque fois. Et il y avait des gens qui, qui volaient, 
qui arrachait les bagues des doigts, des bras, des jambes. Je ne peux pas continuer. The Germans, for propaganda purposes, published a picture of a man and a woman apparently carrying a baby. What the Germans didn't realize at the time was the bundle that the lady is carrying in her arms is not a baby, but Eva's archives. And that lady was Blanche Page. On June 3rd, my father and John Brown left Madame Claus House. The two airmen were moved to an abandoned cafe where they stayed for three weeks. While there, news reached them of the Allied invasion at Normandy. We asked the fellow in charge of us, we said, is anyone going to be staying at Madame Clyde's house? He said, yeah, we'll put someone there. We said, well, can we go back? After returning to Madame Clyde's house, my father spent his last night as an evader in Brussels. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning, and we were still in bed. And we heard a banging on the door. And we heard Madame Cly come running up the steps. And she was saying, the Gestapo, the Gestapo. There were some French doors on the back side of our room. I went through those French doors and was getting ready to jump off the roof and look down below. And there was a German soldier. I backed out of his line of vision. Went back in the house and they, they grabbed us and uh, they took John and I and Madame Cly. They separated you from John and yes. the woman. Yes. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I didn't know what John was telling them. Yeah. John didn't know what I was telling them. Madame Cly, we, we don't know what she was telling them. David asked me. Uh, about uh, going back to St. Giles Prison. <laughs> and uh, I told him, <laughs> I said, well, now I haven't made up my mind about St. Giles Prison. There was a large German flag with a big swastika hanging on it from one of those towers, yeah. I guess. Kind of turned and looked back, and there were three or four women out here sweeping the street. Sure, it's nice to be on this side. <laughs> the Allied Airmen had this sort of very vague status of not being a political prisoner and not being a POW. Uh, and they were looked upon surely as spies because they had been caught in civilian clothing. That was probably one of the lowest moments in my life when I was uh, taken into prison. I just kind of felt like I'd lost my last friend. When you lose your freedom, why? It's quite a jolt to you. Going back to saint Gilles prison with Dad was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Up until the moment we walked through the front gate, I didn't know if he would do it.
that's the courtyard where we were just standing with. Yeah. Do you know what that is? You know scene? Well, it, they had bars on the way. Yeah. And uh, you, you might be able to see another building out there. Yeah. yeah but that's about all. I was locked up with the deserters for six weeks, maybe six, seven weeks. They started interrogating me. They wanted to know who I'd been staying with and where. And I told them, I said, well, I don't know. The fellow that uh, was interrogating me told me, he says, well, he says, we've got the easy way of doing things, and we've got the hard way of doing things. He says, it looks to me like you're going to do it the hard way. And uh, they sent me back to my cell, and I thought, well, that, that wasn't too bad. And a German guard came and called out my name, and he said, Dougal Cell. And I turned to one of the other guys, and I said, what did he say? He said, he said, Dark Cell. The Dark Cell was about three feet by six feet. The only time I saw any daylight was when they'd opened the door and threw some a bowl of food in there. The dark cell was just large enough where you could lie down in it. When they closed that door, it was just, it was dark in there. There, there wasn't any uh, light at all. And they had an old iron bucket that was over in the corner for, uh, that was your toilet facilities, and that's all there was in the cell. The door had three little round holes drilled in the top of it. And I used to move that old iron bucket over by the door, and I'd stand on it and look out those holes, and I could look down onto the, the cell block that I was in. I heard a guy getting beat up real bad one night. Some fella had tried to commit suicide and tried to slash his wrists. The German officer came down there, and that kid was beaten up, something horrible. I was in that dark cell for about the next 30 days. It got awfully quiet at night. I began to hear voices. I just hoped they were in my head and not, not real. They were interrogating me, wanting to know where I, all about me. When I would think of something, like some location where I'd been, somebody that had kept me. They immediately read my mind. Just tried not to think about where I'd been, what I'd been doing. I spent the entire month of August in the dark zone. In late July, we had the attempted assassination of Hitler take place. And because so many of members of the Abwehr were implicated, they were no longer an effective force politically in Germany. The SD soon filled the vacuum. The SD were, uh, were the secret police. They had no qualms about the laws of humanity or, or the Geneva Convention. They were alarmed to themselves. They just started arresting everyone. And they, they knew who to arrest, pretty much. They, they had been looking at them for a long time. And indeed, I think there was a, a certain sense of revenge involved in those arrests. Nous étions à la maison. Et mes parents ont été arrêtés à l'aube. Ils nous ont laissés à la maison, tout simplement, mon frère et moi. Donc mes parents ont été arrêtés, ma sœur aussi. Puis comme j'étais huit ans plus jeune que ma sœur, une gamine, donc je suis restée. Ma mère et moi étions arrêtés. 
One morning very early in August, the Gestapo arrived. They just broke the glass of the door and uh, we had to leave my brother, younger brother and younger sister on their own. They made us climb in this lorry. And now one neighbor came out of his house next door. He said, Madame Drigge, whatever is happening. Mother said, well, it looks as if we're being arrested by the Gestapo. And what, for what reason, he said, but I don't think Mother gave him a lot of explanations. I said to Mother, what have I done to be put in prison? On August 28, 1944, the SD raided the home of Josephine van der Grat, the widow with whom my father and another airman spent Christmas. Although she was 58 and a widow, the Germans took her to saint Gilles prison. Le tortionnaire m'a aussitôt frappé sauvagement en plein visage à plusieurs reprises. J'en étais étourdi. M'adressant aux cinq, je leur ai demandé :« Vous n'avez sans doute pas de mère. » Ils m'ont répondu en cœur, « Non, nous n'avons pas de mer, rien qu'une patrie. » Le tortionnaire a pris un vieux tuyau à gaz et a recommencé à me frapper sur tout le corps. J'étais étourdi par les coups. Ensuite, il a dit, « Savez-vous le tort que vous avez fait en hébergeant les Anglais ?» Comme je disais, « Non. » Il a répondu, « Chaque Anglais hébergé équivaut à un bataillon de soldats allemands abattus. » J'en ai ressenti une grande joie en me disant que je n'avais pas souffert pour rien. Papa était un idéaliste et il était épris de liberté. Il avait un très grand sens du devoir et d'honneur. Il, il avait quand même quatre enfants et des petits-enfants. C'était un chef admirable. Dans une colonne en marche, on l'a abattu. Hein. Donc il est mort à cet endroit-là, entre Magdebourg et Dessour, on ne sait pas exactement où. Et dans les documents que, que vous m'avez remis, il y a une autre lettre dans laquelle on dit qu'il a été abattu d'une balle dans la nuque. Donc il n'a pas été abattu en courant, on l'a froidement exécuté de une balle dans la nuque. I remember a little prayer <laughs> that I used to say. I don't know why or I don't know when, but I know this is not what you intended for my outcome to be, that I will get out of here. In the, in the courtyard, they were burning papers in barrels. They had fires going in different, several barrels and they're burning papers gave me the impression that they were getting ready to evacuate the prison. Sure as could be, they took us out of the cell. Suddenly they evacuated all the prison without telling us for what reason. I was in the dark cell when they uh, evacuated the prison. The British troops were getting to the very edge of Brussels and about to liberate Brussels. An order was given from Germany that all prisons in Belgium had to be emptied and all prisoners, political as, as well as military prisoners, were to be moved back to Germany. Uh, we put into big army uh, lorries again, taken that to the midi station, put into wagons. 
The prisoners, including dozens of people who had helped my father, were forced into cattle wagons that were waiting to take them to camps in Germany. Up to 100 people were crammed into each single cattle car without food or water. They took some trucks to the railroad station and uh, loaded us on cars like this. There were about 1,370 political prisoners and some 43 airmen, allied airmen. And they were going to be taken to Germany. At the state the war was in then, there was an awful lot of confusion. And I thought, well, they'll back this prison train up to a concentration camp and just unload all of us. They won't bother about separating us and sending us to a prisoner of war camp. From that moment on, the resistance put everything in their power to prevent that train from getting out of the Brussels station. Even the people of the railways themselves, this whole story of this train has become known as the story of the ghost train. We stayed in this boxcar right at first, I think, all day long. It didn't move. And we could see the German army retreating up the highway, right. and they were in horse-drawn vehicles on foot, uh, pushing baby carriages with things in it. You just felt like, man, if I can just get out of this thing for just a moment, I can be free. The train left Brussels. Occasionally it would stop uh, and the guards would get out and patrol up and down the side of the train. Uh, we were on that train two days, and I don't believe we ever moved over 10 miles. The train stopped several times on its way to wherever it was going, Germany, I presume. The train didn't get far at all. The underground sabotaged the track and derailed it. They were doing everything they could to delay that thing, keeping it from uh, getting out of Belgium. At one time, we could hear planes uh, coming over the train, and they started machine gunning on the train. And we thought whoever it was in the planes must have thought it was a German train full of soldiers, German soldiers going to Germany or, or, or whatever. The people of the resistance started negotiating with the German commander, asking him to actually be able to open all these cattle cars and let the people out. He finally gave in. And they let all the civilians go free. They broke all, open our compartments and released us. The people of the resistance went to that train, opened it up, got everybody out, took care that they vanished from the station in a as fast as possible. The political prisoners were set free, and in their place, the train was filled with retreating German soldiers. But the Germans refused to release my father and the other airmen. They were kept locked in their cattle car, and once again, the train left for Germany. Hours later, the train came to a stop at a railroad yard some 10 miles away. And as we tried to get out of the uh, railroad yards, the train got derailed. The last wagon, where the Americans were in, wasn't attached to the train anymore. The cattle car had indeed been detached from the train by the Germans. The 43 airmen were sitting in a cattle wagon and they had no food and they had nothing to drink. And the people inside were not having a very pleasant time. I was still hearing voices and uh, I just wasn't really there mentally. I met John Brown again. I told him that I'd been in the dark cell for about 31 days. He seemed to be kind of amazed that I was been kept in there so long. And I told him about uh, hearing the voices. I said I felt like the Germans knew everything that I knew. He said, well, Bill, he said, everybody talked. That's about as far as the conversation went. They suddenly realized that they weren't being guarded anymore. It was then that one of them 
managed to open the cattle car. Once I knew they had the box car door open, and I felt like, well, I'm going to get out of this thing. I'm either going to get away or get shot. We took off. It was kind of late in the evening. We got away from the freight yards. We hid out that night in kind of a bombed out building. We stayed in that building till it started to get light. And there were five of us walking down the street. The Belgium resistance had kind of put out a police force to right. con control the city. We walked around that corner <laughs> and just getting daylight. And we, we scared this kid to death. He had his rifle and he lined us up against the wall. I thought, oh hell, we're gonna get shot right now after we've escaped. <laughs> but uh, there was one fella in the group that could speak French real well. And uh, he rattled off that we were escaped prisoners, escaped off the prison train. And uh, the fellow finally believed us. We walked back to here, to the Chaussée de Havre. By then, I think uh, there must have been an, a telegram message because everybody knew we were arriving as we walked through the, the town. We were so happy to be back. after we'd escaped from the train. And they held us a day till the British Second Army came in and took over control of Brussels. Then they took us down to the Metropole Hotel. The most beautiful thing that I saw was going into the Metropole Hotel and seeing that the British Second Army <laughs> had taken over and realizing that we were free. It was several days of celebrations then. We had a bottle of beer and corned beef sandwich on white bread, and you never tasted anything so good in all your life. At last, we were free of the Germans. We were arm in arm, walking down in Brussels, and they were singing and this, that, and the other thing. And we stopped for a while before we got to Brussels. And this was, I guess, still in Scarbeck. They raised the Belgian flag for the first time in four years. Everybody was crying, tears coming down from the Mets eyes. It was uh, a, a whole crowd of people all celebrating. A lot of the people that had kept us uh, showed up and, and we got to see them again. And I got a lot of names and addresses then that uh, I've still got a notebook that David's got. After uh, the liberation, why? They picked us up down at the Metropole, and uh, we came out here, and there's John Brown, myself, the people that I was staying with right around the corner, and we had a big party that day. And then that's where the picture was taken. Yeah, that's what so it's like right down this right, street. Right down here. Je crois que c'est un devoir des anciens de faire savoir et connaître aux jeunes qui fut un temps où la vie n'était pas facile, où les difficultés s'accumulaient, où l'aide était nécessaire. Je ne suis pas professeur de morale ni politicien. Je leur dis. Le bien le plus précieux, c'est la liberté. For me, the most important thing is to be free. To be free. So you must fight for freedom. Le bilan de Comet 
est quand même euh, d'avoir rapatrié 700 aviateurs en Angleterre. Mais si on fait les comptes maintenant de tous ceux qui sont morts en comète, on arrive à un minimum aussi de 700 personnes, ce qui donne évidemment un mort pour sauver un aviateur. It was worth helping. It was doing what I couldn't do more. I couldn't fight like a, like a soldier, but this was my way of fighting. On doit garder à l'esprit toujours que tant de gens sont morts pour qu'on soit libre. Mais je crois que beaucoup de ces gens qui sont morts ne le regretteraient pas. Nous voulions apporter euh, notre petite pierre à la construction, de, à la défense, à la liberté de notre pays et à la reconstruction d'une démocratie euh, réelle. Alors voilà l'image de Grosvenor, elle me restera gravée, bien heureuse dans mon esprit. J'ai revu ma jeunesse. Il représente ma jeunesse, ce monsieur, qui s'est permis de vivre comme moi encore. Il a le même âge que moi. Quand je l'ai revu, je l'ai embrassé parce que c'est du bon pain pour moi. <rire> non. Déjà, quand j'ai vu son fils et que j'ai su pourquoi il est rentré en Belgique, je sais quand même bien cette reconnaissance. I uh, caught a ride in a jeep with a Bill White, who was a newsman. I rode from Belgium to Paris with him. And uh, when I left Belgium, I felt like I probably would never return. Going back to Belgium with my father, we'd hoped to find a few people who knew something about his story. We found so much more including a group of aviation enthusiasts who were only too happy to excavate Dad's thunderbolt from the meadow where he had crashed. We're going to try to find traces of Bill Grosvenor's thunderbolts. And we are always hoping that some remains may be hidden in the ground. My father, my mother and I witnessed its resurrection on a chilly, overcast day. journey back led us to an amazing number of people with stories to tell. In the telling, many of them, including my father, seemed to come to a place of long overdue resolution and peace. While I'll never know what my father would have been like had he not endured the storm of war, going back helped me better understand the man he is a man who lives each day as a gift and chooses to see the good in everyone. It's a part of his life. He has kind of put in the background and I think it's a good time for him to just let it all come out. It's been so much more than I had ever dreamed. Le mot n'est pas de moi, la primauté du spirituel. C'est le, le spirituel qui doit, qui, qui soulève, qui soulève, qui, qui agrandit. If you want to see what a hero looks like, all you have to do is look at the people that were involved in safe houses, as keepers and as messengers and as guides, and very few of them look like the Hollywood hero. You know, most of them look like your grandmother, or my aunt, or his mother. They're just simple, common people. The, the, the people, uh, they, they risk so much when they help you. And uh, you couldn't help but appreciate it. The, 
most important thing is being good and doing good, doing the good you can. A day, a day, help the others if you can. And, and see the, the nice things in life. See when it's when when it's a sunny day and see, take the good out. Not 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 expect very big things. Just be be satisfied with the, with every day small things that are good. Every day there is a, a moment that you think, oh, well, this is pleasant. Even if it's just a glimpse, uh, not, not expect very big things. I think. Don't you think so? Isolation 